be presenting on a stress reduction program for caregivers of those with brain injuries. I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. So following this session, you should be able to understand the purpose and rationale behind the need for a formal stress reduction program for caregivers, understand the importance behind the objectives of the formal stress reduction program, understand what an occupational profile is and its importance in discovering occupational imbalances in caregivers' lives, and we're going to examine and understand the positive outcomes that a formal stress reduction program can have on caregivers. So briefly, I'm going to speak on the original stress reduction program I provided for caregivers, and it was for caregivers of those with Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. I carried this program out for my um, occupational therapy doctoral capstone. So I'm going to take the premise of this program. I did it with a few different groups of caregivers of those with ADRD, and we're going to take those concepts and apply it um, apply the strategies and the positive outcomes for those uh, caregivers of those with brain injuries. Um, so the reason behind this program's production of those with Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias is the fact that there's 35.6 million people living with ADRD, and that number is expected to triple by the year 2050. Um, because this number is going to be so large, the number of formal, who are healthcare professionals, paid professionals, and informal, unpaid family, friend, caregivers will be expected to drastically increase as well. So we need to learn how to take care of all of these caregivers that are taking um, care of all of these individuals with ADRD. So those with ADRD experience a significant cognitive decline in learning and memory, language, executive function, complex attention, perceptual motor and or social cognition and they can experience behavioral disturbances such as delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, wandering and elopement, impaired judgment, impaired safety awareness, and various other symptoms. So these behaviors that I just mentioned lead to negative caregiver symptoms. These negative caregiver symptoms can include anxiety, depression, exhaustion, disappointment, and anger. And this negatively impacts the care that one is providing to the person with ADRD, whether consciously or subconsciously. Caregivers also tend to be unaware of functional coping strategies or use dysfunctional coping strategies, which we'll get into later on in the presentation. They use these uh, dysfunctional coping strategies or lack functional coping strategies because they lack education about the diagnosis of ADRD from professionals the sudden onset of the diagnosis and the denial of the impact of the diagnosis in general. The same thing happens to those with brain injuries. We get a diagnosis of ADRD, we get a diagnosis of brain injury, then what? This is really lacking in the primary care setting when um, these individuals are diagnosed, which leads to caregivers being unaware of how to care for their loved one. So the original program that was conducted um, had 15 total participants, 14 of them were formal caregivers, which ranged from nurses, CNAs, activity directors, OTs, PTs, SLPs, directors of rehab, and then one informal caregiver who was a daughter of somebody with ADRD. The participants were recruited from a memory care assisted living facility and skilled nursing facility in the surrounding community. This particular program consisted of five sessions, 30 to 45 minutes each, once per week over a five week span because that's what was found to be conducive to um, this population. So the outcomes of the original program, I will get into the pre and post tests later on in the presentation. This is just a brief overview. So the beginning average stress level that was based on a subjective Likert scale survey was a 6.3 out of 10. The average competence in caregiving was happened to also be a 6.3 out of 10. And the caregivers wrote on their pre-survey that they hope to learn communication techniques with their loved one or the person they're caring for, how to decrease caregiver burden, and how to implement healthy coping strategies into their day. So it was really important to conduct the pre-test to know these things because I was able to tailor the program to the needs of the group that I was working with. 
So 46.7% of the participants stated they did not currently have any coping or stress reduction techniques in their day. And their current stress reduction strategies included shopping, exercising, reading, meditation, crying, smoking, drinking, talking, and or taking medications. So there was um, somewhat of a balance between healthy and unhealthy coping strategies. So at the end of the program, uh, a similar post-test survey was given and the average stress level decreased to a 5.3. The average competence did increase to an eight. All participants stated that they had a better understanding of how to avoid negative conflicts and behaviors, and all participants felt that they learned effective stress reduction techniques. So with this, I was able to take the positive aspects of this program and turn it into and apply it to a program for caregivers of those with brain injuries. So we are going to get into now the program rationale for caregivers of those with brain injuries. So according to the CDC, 2.5 million people sustain a traumatic brain injury annually in the US. Acquired brain trauma is the second most prevalent disability in the US, estimated at 13.5 million Americans. And presently, over 5.2 million individuals in the US are disabled due to the myriad of sequelae of a TBI. So again, like I mentioned with those with ADRD, this means because of the high number of those with brain injuries, this also means for a high number of formal and informal caregivers as well. Behavioral and psychological symptoms experienced by those with brain injuries increase the stress level of caregivers. Caregivers, again, may have dysfunctional coping mechanisms that can lead to depression and toxic relationships um, with the person they're caring for, along with others that they have relationships with in their lives as well. And occupational therapists are trained in providing caregivers with strategies to assist in caring for those with brain injuries and in finding their occupational balance. So the symptoms that were identified that cause the most caregiver stress that are exhibited by those with brain injuries include atypical motor behaviors, hallucinations, apathy, agitation, cursing, incoherent speech, and nonsensical conversations. The aforementioned symptoms, again, lead to negative caregiver symptoms, including anxiety, depression, exhaustion, disappointment, and anger. And these negative caregiver symptoms stem from the fact that caregivers have these dysfunctional coping strategies. And again, these negative caregiver symptoms can definitely negatively impact the quality of the care that they're providing to the person with the brain injury. So we're gonna go over some caregiver statistics that um, relate to the reasons why we need to implement more formal stress reduction programs for caregivers. So there's 44 million Americans age 18 plus who provide unpaid assistance and support to older people and adults with disabilities who live in the community. So that's 44 million unpaid caregivers and there's over double this number of formal or paid caregivers. The value of this unpaid labor force is estimated to be $306 billion annually. And just to put that into perspective, that's nearly double the combined cost of home health care and nursing home care combined. So caregivers want to keep loved ones at home as long as possible. And that's the reason for this un the high number of this unpaid labor source. The trouble with that is caregiving requirements increase as the disease progresses, so caregiving becomes more difficult at home. Uh, caregivers struggle due to the lack of education about the diagnosis that we talked about previously. And then they tend to seek formal caregivers who may also lack education. Um, just because the person is a formal caregiver does not mean that they are trained in the area of caring for someone specifically with a brain injury. So that tends to lead to negative caregiver symptoms as well, not having enough knowledge in that specific area. Caregiver burden can be defined as the strain or load borne by a person who cares for a chronically ill, disabled, or elderly family member. As we would expect, as the hours spent caregiving increases, the caregiver burden increases as well. 
And this depiction shows that as people get, as caregivers get older, they actually tend to spend more time um, providing care because they may not be working anymore. Their spouse might be getting older. So thinking of somebody in the 75 plus range providing 34 and a half hours per week as a caregiver, that tends to um, increase the stress level both on their physical and their mental health. So caregivers and depression and anxiety. So this really states why we need to take care of our caregivers. So estimates show between 40 to 70% of caregivers have clinically significant symptoms of depression. Studies consistently report higher levels of depressive symptoms among caregivers than among their non-caregiving peers. Both caregiver depression and perceived burden increase as the care receiver's functional status declines. Depression and anxiety disorders persist and can even worsen after the placement of the patient in a residential care facility. That tends to surprise people, but many caregivers who institutionalize their relative report depressive symptoms and anxiety to be as high as it was when the care was at home. That comes with the worry that happens when the person's no longer home with you. You hope they're receiving good care and it comes with um, caregiver guilt that they have for putting somebody in a facility. Along with this, the Depressed caregivers are more likely to have coexisting anxiety disorders, substance abuse or dependence, and chronic disease. And as most of us know, depression is also one of the most common conditions associated with suicide attempts. So we want to decrease caregivers' depression and anxiety at all costs to not only improve their health, but improve the health and quality of care that the person with the brain injury is receiving. So caregivers and stress and frustration. Caregivers have higher levels of stress than non-caregivers. That goes without saying. Um, caregivers have less self-acceptance and feel less effective and less in control of their lives than non-caregivers. About 16% of caregivers feel emotionally strained and 26% say taking care of the care recipient is hard on them emotionally. Along with this, 13% of caregivers feel frustrated with the lack of progress made with the care recipient. This is important for us as therapists, social workers, nurses, the clinical team to be aware of so they can empathize and update caregivers on the progress as well. Caregiving can also result in feeling a loss of self-identity, lower levels of self-esteem, constant worry, or feelings of uncertainty. They also report that they describe feeling frustrated, angry, drained, guilty, or helpless in general. And 22% of caregivers feel that they cannot handle all their caregiving responsibilities. Along with this, caregivers who experience chronic stress may be at greater risk for cognitive decline, including loss in short-term memory and attention, which definitely becomes a problem, not only in their own lives, but in their caregiving lives as well, because it decreases their ability to help care for the person. So then there are women and minority caregivers. So female caregivers comprise about two thirds of all unpaid caregivers. They say that daughters, sisters, mothers tend to um, jump to the caregiving role more than their male counter counterparts. Uh, female caregivers tend to fare worse than their male counterparts, reporting higher levels of depressive and anxiety symptoms, and lower levels of subjective well-being, life satisfaction, and physical health. They also tend to neglect their own health needs. In a national survey on caregiver health, more than one in five women surveyed had mammograms less, less often, so just not caring for their own physical health. There's a dramatic increase in the risk of mental health consequences among women who provide 36 plus hours per week of care to a spouse. And African-American caregivers spend more hours per week caregiving, are at higher risk for emotional distress, and tend to be less likely to use community supports. So again, that's something we should be aware of and assist with encouraging the use of those community supports among these caregivers. So caregiving and harmful behaviors. As a response to increased stress, caregivers are shown to have increased substance use. 
studies have shown that caregivers use prescription and psychotropic drugs more often than their non-caregiving peers. Family caregivers are at greater risk for higher levels of hostility. Um, they knew the person before their injury. Uh, this tends to lead to those higher levels of hostility than you would see with non-family caregivers. And spousal caregivers who are at risk of clinical depression and are caring for a spouse with significant cognitive or physical care needs are more likely to engage in harmful behavior toward their loved one. So that could be a type of verbal abuse, physical abuse, and that tends to occur when the spouse, spousal caregiver is at higher risk of depression. Now, caregivers and physical health, because of course, physical health is impacted by caregiving as well. About one in 10 caregivers report that caregiving has caused their physical health to, to get worse. Caregivers report chronic conditions at nearly twice the rate of non-caregivers. These chronic conditions include heart attack and heart disease, cancer, diabetes and arthritis, and caregivers suffer from increased rates of physical ailments, including acid reflux, headaches, and aches and pains. They also have an increased tendency to develop serious illness and have higher levels of obesity and bodily pain. Studies have also demonstrated that caregivers have a diminished immune response, which leads to frequent infection and increased risk of cancers. That diminished immune response can also just mean they have a cold more often. And even something as simple as that can really negatively impact the care that they're providing to a person with a brain injury. And the physical stress of caregiving can of course affect the physical health of the caregiver. Caregivers are shown to have a 23% higher level of stress hormones and a 15% lower level of antibody responses, especially when providing care for someone who cannot transfer him or herself out of bed, out of chairs, walk or bathe without assistance because they're physically having to help them with the, these activities. So it diminishes their own antibody response and increases their own levels of stress hormones. Caregivers and self-care. So as we mentioned before with the women caregivers and their mammograms, caregivers are less likely to engage in all sorts of preventative health behaviors. Spousal caregivers who provide 36 plus hours per week of care are more likely to smoke and consume more saturated fat. About six in 10 caregivers in a national survey reported that their eating and exercise habits are worse than before they took on the caregiving role. Nearly 75% of caregivers reported that they had not gone to the doctor as often as they should, and more than half had missed doctor's appointments altogether. And elderly spousal caregivers aged 66 to 96 who experience caregiving related stress have a 63% higher mortality rate than non-caregivers their same age. So caregivers self-care ultimately suffers because they lack the time and energy to prepare proper meals or exercise for themselves. And then on top of this, caregivers in rural areas are at a greater disadvantage for having their own medical needs met due to difficulty getting to the hospital and doctors. So they're already struggling enough in these rural areas to provide care for the person they're caring for. So they just put their self-care needs um, on hold or to the side because of this. So this is where we really need to question who's going to take care of the caregiver in these situations. So increasing caregiver mental health. Although caregiving can have a negative impact on caregivers' health and well-being, research demonstrates its effects can be alleviated at least partially by a formal assessment of family caregiver needs that leads to a care plan with support services. So this will be tailored to the individual family. Caregiver education and support programs respite care for the person who's receiving the care to reduce caregiver burden, financial support from community supports to alleviate the economic stress of caregiving because economic stress can ultimately lead to mental stress and mental health problems, 
and along with this primary care interventions that address caregiver needs. Like we mentioned before, um, this is really lacking in the primary care setting, setting and needs to be addressed in order to increase the caregiver's mental health. So we're gonna go back to program rationale after all of those caregiver statistics. So caregivers, as we have seen through those statistics, tend to have an occupational imbalance in their lives. So what an occupational imbalance is, it's a disproportionate amount of time spent in required and strenuous activities versus the time spent in leisure and chosen activities. So things you have to do versus the amount of time you spend the things that you want to do. And caregivers tend to spend a greater portion of their time in the caregiver role and neglect their own self-care occupations. So why an OT? Why would an OT provide a stress reduction program for caregivers. So OTs assist with activities that make up a person's daily life. We identify stressors in life to improve the management of stress. We're concerned with the patient's ability to achieve health enhancing independent living skills. And we're in a key position to help patients master stress management skills and incorporate them into activities of daily living. OTs also help to solve the problems that interfere with our ability to do the things that are important to us, such as self-care, which includes eating, personal hygiene, getting dressed, being productive, which is going to work, grocery shopping, paying the bills, and leisure activities such as sports, gardening, social activities, things that uh, you would like to do in your free time. So OTs are also trained to help support people to regain function in the various areas of life, which is what caregivers need to do. They need to regain those leisure occupations, those self-care occupations. Occupational performance, which in this case would be the caregiver role, is the result of the dynamic interaction between the person, their environment, and the occupation. So when one changes, everything else is affected and performance changes as well. And OT is unique in that it takes a holistic approach to health and wellness. So when an OT sees an individual suffering from chronic stress, they don't just look at, look at individual factors, rather they look at the interaction between the person, the environment, and the occupation in order to determine the cause of stress and how to relieve that stressor. So what we're gonna talk about is the person environment occupation model, which leads to that occupational performance. So this model emphasizes that occupational performance is shaped by the interaction, like I've been saying, between the person environment and occupation. So what the person domain consists of is a person's role, self-concept, cultural background, personality, health, cognition, physical performance, and sensory capabilities. It also consists of the environment domain, which is the physical, cultural, institutional, social, and socioeconomic environment, and the occupation domain, which refers to the groups of tasks a person engages in that meets his or her self-maintenance, expression, and fulfillment. So all three domains are dependent on and affected by one another. We can use this model to analyze problematic areas that affect a person's occupational performance and to improve their performance by enhancing the congruence of these three domains. So where these three domains overlap, how they overlap and uh, making them more positively overlap. So this is just an example of the PEO model. So in the middle, we have our occupational performance, which would be the caregiver role. So that depends on the person. So say this person has intact cognitive skills, but they may be mentally drained as a caregiver. They enjoy caring for others, but they have a disrupted role slash self-concept because of their occupational imbalance and they're physically fit. Their environment, say they work in a loud, crowded work environment, maybe a busy hospital. They have to answer to others, to their boss, and they have time constraints or productivity demands. And their occupation would be that they're physically lifting, they're negotiating with the person they're caring for, they're trying to manage their time, trying to build a trusting relationship, they're balancing, they're speaking, they're motor planning, and all of these things come together 
to um, give them their occupational performance of caregiving. So how these things interact shows how positively or negatively someone performs their caregiver role. So again, why an OT? So 10 ways an OT can help manage stress, I'm not going to read all of them, but a few of them are supporting with, the, with developing behavioral adaptations, intervening with mindfulness, based stress reduction techniques, facilitating and assisting with turn, return to work, and the others that are listed here. So we're gonna talk about some theoretical frameworks. The frameworks help plan the stress reduction programs, and we can use one or all, all of them, depending on the population that we're developing the stress reduction program for. So family systems theory. This theory it views families as a system of interrelated parts where the actions of one component of the system influence can impact the development of every other component, as well as the functioning of the overall system. So in this theory, families are believed to be the experts on their own family, and we as practitioners need to respect that. Progress occurs when professionals explore family values and beliefs, not instilling new family values and beliefs, but exploring this family's own. And it takes a positive view of families, assuming every family has the capacity to solve problems and make changes. And this is really important because it really sets the tone for using this positive framework in practice. The next theory is the cognitive behavioral family theory. It has an ABC philosophy of emotion and behavior processes where A is the activating agent. This is when neither the individual nor the families are in control of the activating agent. An example is that they don't have control over the accident that occurred that caused the brain injury, or they don't have control over the medical decisions. And then there's the belief, where we show individuals and families that they do have control of what that event means. An example could be this, this accident will be the end of our family, or the accident means um, that we are strong and we will persevere through this. And then the C is the consequence of the belief. We help families change their beliefs, in, which will result in a change in feelings and outcomes. So families do have control over the consequence of their belief. Um, if they think this will be the end of their family, then it's a poor ending and hopeless. But if they think they're strong and will persevere, then they see progress and are encouraged. So the focus of us as the professional would be to encourage the family to look at this from a different perspective. If they change their beliefs, it can result in a change in their feelings and outcomes. So with the cognitive behavioral family theory, some perspectives to help professionals conceptualize treatment would be that another point of view always exists, trying a lot of Families at this point have a negative view, trying to show them that there is a positive view. Um, showing that events are not responsible for feelings, that we are in control of our own feelings, that feelings do in fact impact our behavior, and that each individual and family have unique experiences which shape their beliefs. Then we have the last theory, which would be the resilience theory. So, which is based on the notion that no matter how catastrophic an event, there are always individuals and families who rise above the expected negative outcomes. Um, the families tend to have this following skill set. They have a belief system defined by making meaning out of adversity and having inherent spirituality, and a family organization that includes the capacity to change supportive connection between family members and a willingness to use social resources. We also, as professionals, would teach communication strategies which are clear, emotionally open, and take a collaborative approach amongst the family members to problem solving. Some common approaches that we can also take would be to encourage conversations focused on strengths of the family and individuals rather than their deficits helping whole families to get and stay involved in the process of the individual's healing. Normally it's easier and has more positive out outcomes when the whole family is involved. 
stressing the importance of an optimistic and future-oriented outlook, letting families know that struggling during rehab is normal, but taking an opt optimistic outlook, and teaching families to track stressors and coping over time and to identify incremental progress, because progress is always positive no matter how small it may seem. So now we're going to get into the purpose, rationale, and objectives of the formal stress reduction program. So I'm going to go through all five days of the stress reduction program for caregivers of those with brain injuries. And we're, I'm going to run it as, as if you're the stress reduction, you're the caregivers I'm providing the stress reduction program to. So in the beginning, when I present this, I would give them a program purpose. So the purpose of this program is to develop and run a program that teaches caregivers about what the person with a brain injury is experiencing during their diagnosis, how they can assist them in their daily activities while still achieving occupational balance in their own lives, and to provide stress reduction techniques to maintain a healthy quality of life for both the caregiver and the person who's receiving the care. So it seems like a lot, but it can definitely get done in all five days of the program. So some day one objectives. Um, per, the first objective would be to provide caregivers with the definition of traumatic brain injury and non-traumatic brain injury. Examine the different types of brain injuries and the signs and symptoms of each di diagnosis and provide caregivers with evidence-based research on the effects caregiving has on caregivers of those with brain injuries. So if you had a different type of group of caregivers, say they were all caregivers of people with traumatic brain injury, there wasn't anybody in the group with a non-traumatic brain injury, you could leave that definition out, but this is more of a generalized example of a program that can be run. So then we would define Traumatic brain injury, again, they're lacking this education at the primary care level, which leads to a lack of knowledge. So giving them this knowledge in a program is very helpful. So a TBI is defined as the alteration in brain function or other evidence of brain pathology caused by an external force. There's open TBIs, which are results when the skull is broken, back fractured or penetrated, may occur when a foreign object goes through the skull, enters the brain and damages specific parts of the brain. This localized brain damage occurs along the route that the object has traveled. But symptoms following an open TBI may vary depending on the parts of the brain that are damaged. There's a closed TBI as well. This results when an outside force impacts the head but the skull is not broken, fractured, or penetrated. This may happen, for example, when the head strikes the windshield or dashboard in a car accident. And damage is typically widespread or diffuse. Again, symptoms following a closed TBI vary depending on the extent of the damage to the brain. Some leading causes of TBI. Again, this is important for caregivers to know that they occur in all different types of forms, that they're not alone in this situation. So falls, motor vehicle crashes, struck by or against something, assaults and other, almost equally make up that 100% circle. And then blasts are a leading cause of TBI for active duty military personnel in war zones. Then we get into the definition of non-traumatic brain injury, which would be damage to the brain caused by internal factors, such as lack of oxygen, exposure to toxins, pressure from a tumor, lead poisoning, et cetera. And TBIs have a direct impact on cells throughout the brain since it attacks the cellular structure. And TBI has the ability to spread to all areas of the brain as opposed to a TBI, which can only, may only affect concentrated areas. Some common types of non-traumatic brain injuries are an anoxic injury, which is when the brain receives inadequate levels of oxygen, usually following cardiac arrest when there is minimal to no blood reaching the brain. Toxic or metabolic injury, this occurs after coming into contact with unsafe substances such as lead or detrimental accumulation of chemicals manufactured within the body, such as kidney failure. There's encephalitis, which is caused by an infection of the brain viruses, which is the most common cause of non-traumatic brain injury, and then tumors and methods used to treat them, 
because chemotherapy and, relation, and radiation can lead to diffuse brain injury. And then some other common types are meningitis, stroke, drug abuse, and hydrocephalus. So some caregiver statistics, we talked about this earlier, but this is what we would want to relay to caregivers so that they know that they're not alone in this situation. So briefly, again, there's 34.2 million informal caregivers over this double the number of formal caregivers. And caregivers want to keep the loved ones at home as long as possible. Again, it's important to relay this so people know they're not alone in this thought process as well but that why it is difficult to keep these caregivers at home. So then the program objectives for day two, which is really the core of the program. We want to educate caregivers on the differences between dysfunctional, emotion-focused, and problem-focused behavior strategies. Encourage caregivers to discuss their concerns about caring for someone with a brain injury and to participate in an educational session involving role-playing and discussion. So in this day of the program, you really want caregivers to interact with each other in the group. So dysfunctional behavior strategies. A these are defined as a cluster of coping strategies that may elicit adverse outcomes, especially when they're used alone or over a prolonged period of time. These include denial, self-blame and behavioral disengagement and they're related to higher levels of anxiety and depression so the caregiving context the characteristics of the stressor the coping style and coping resources collectively influence the physical and mental health impacts of caregiving so if these are negative or dysfunctional then there everything else tends to be dysfunctional as well so this is a flowchart depiction of dysfunction. It starts with the situation, which is failed ability to complete a task or complete a caregiving requirement. This leads to thoughts that the caregiver thinks I'm a failure, I'm not good enough to do this role. Then it can lead to physiological sensations, which are exhaustion, jittery, heart rate palpitations, muscle tension, or feelings of upset, worthless, hopeless, and then behaviors, they avoid the caregiving tasks, they avoid the contact with the person they're caring for. And you can see that this just goes in a circle. There's no real way out of the dysfunction. It's the easiest reaction we have because it's physiological and pre-programmed in us, but we need to find a way to get out of that dysfunctional coping strategy. So what we would rather use is a problem-focused behavior strategy. These are efforts to define a problem, generate alternative solutions, and conduct a cost-benefit analysis for devising an action plan for the problem. This aims to reduce or remove the stressor by problem solving, time management, active coping, planning and strategy development, and seeking instrumental social support. So we wanna come up with a solution that would not only benefit the person being cared for, but also for yourself as the caregiver. This also offers a long-term solution, but not always the most effective when dealing with other people. We can be very good at using the strategy alone, but when caregiving, it may be difficult, especially if there's other staff members involved and they may not be on board with the plan or be aware of the plan at all. It requires a lot of communication, but the problem-focused behavior strategy is shown to reduce depressive symptoms in caregivers. Another positive behavior strategy is emotion focused. These are efforts to change one's feelings and perceptions about the situation with the goal to lessen the emotional impact of the stressor. So we're trying to reduce the negative emotional responses associated with stress, such as embarrassment, fear, anxiety, depression, and frustration. And we can do these things through positive reframing acceptance and seeking outside emotional support. So emotion focused strategies are good when the source of stress is out of your control and the source of stress is always out of your control when it comes to caregiving. This also may be the only option um, in a situation where you work with other people or there's other caregivers involved, but you're the only one 
aware of the task at the time. So you really need to use that emotion focused strategy rather than problem solving because it might not be conducive to get a whole team on board to problem solve at that very moment. So what we also want to do in this behavior strategy would be to take situations and positively reframe them, which allows for growth and future planning. <clears throat> so we want to acknowledge the presence of benefits. We don't do this enough as people. We definitely don't do it enough as caregivers. Um, so we want to look for small progress, say it's in self-care for the person with brain injury. We want to appreciate the coworker who assists you or the neighbor who offers their assistance. So we really want to acknowledge those small benefits, no matter how small they may be. So this is um, just a depiction between emotion focused and problem focused coping skills. Both tend to experience less emotional distress despite stressful experiences. <clears throat> and they have to do with seeking emotional support systems and it leads to less psychological morbidity. So emotion focus, some examples they have are exercising, giving yourself a pep talk, meditating, and some problem focused are working on time management skills, establishing healthy boundaries, and creating a to-do list. <clears throat> this is a flow chart on when to use problem versus emotion focused coping. So we want to ask ourselves, is there a problem? So yes, there's a problem. Can I change it? Yes or no? Is it a good time to work on it? Yes or no? And that is how you would get to your problem or emotion focused. So say, is there a problem? Yes, I'm caring for someone and we're going to be late for a doctor's appointment that I need to take them to. Can I change it? Well, we have 10 minutes until we have to leave the house for the doctor's appointment and the person's currently in the shower. Now's probably not a good time to try to work on my mind and the person I'm caring for is time management skills can't change it, we go to emotion focus coping. Try to not get angry, try to reduce that stress in that moment so you can carry out the rest of your tasks. Now, if um, we realize, yes, we can change it. Yes, I can work on time management skills, but is now a good time? Like we just said, they might be in the shower, they might have 10 minutes to have to do what they have to do. No, again, we'd go to emotion focused. But if you, then go to the doctor's appointment you come home you have a free rest of the afternoon yes it is a good time to work on our time management skills let's try to use some problem focused coping now so you can use a combination of both of these um, positive coping strategies in order to lead to more positive caregiver routines and then we want to match the situation and the stressor is the situation controllable are we able to control it ourselves um, if yes, we would use that problem-focused coping strategy. But if it's uncontrollable, we automatically have to use that emotion-focused. Um, we'll drive ourselves a little nuts trying to control a situation that's uncontrollable, which will lead to those dysfunctional behavior strategies in that circle that we cannot get out of. So we really have to um, identify if it's uncontrollable to use those emotion-focused strategies. So some techniques and suggestions, um, this can help determine if we can change the situation or not. So we wanna ask ourselves, what's triggering the behavior? Is it internal, which would be hunger, pain, urine retention? Can we help change those in order to change the behavior? Is it external, noise, visual, visual stimulation? Again, can we change those? And what is the person trying to communicate? Again, we can ask, what are the feelings being expressed? This might help, um, might help us in our own emotion-focused coping skills, or it might help us problem-solve to use those problem-focused behavior approaches later on. And can I do anything um, to change the situation? We'll go through that flow chart. If yes, continue with the change. If no, let's use those emotion-focused strategies, and can we keep the situation from getting worse? And then at the end of the day on this program, you'd want to role play and discussion. These are three role play situations that are just very uh, standard. You can definitely change the role playing situation to the group of caregivers you're working with. And you really want the caregivers to interact with each other. Um, when I carried out this 
program a few times, all of the participants in the program knew each other well, they felt comfortable around each other. Role playing wasn't too much of an issue. They were able to do that really well and get something out of it. If, if the group is newer to each other, they don't feel comfortable talking these situations out is also a good alternative. Program objectives of day three, we wanna educate the caregivers on healthy coping strategies, discuss current stress outlets and coping strategies with other group members, again, encouraging that discussion, learn how to implement feasible, healthy coping strategies into their own daily routine, because I noticed on the pretest that not many people had healthy strategies in their daily routine. And we wanna educate on occupational balance and developing their own occupational configuration. So coping strategies, we're gonna have some probing questions in order to get the group to brainstorm. Um, what do we think coping strategies are? Coping strategies are when we invest our own conscious effort to solve personal and interpersonal problems in order to try to master, minimize, or tolerate stress and conflict. And along with that, we have unhealthy and healthy coping strategies. Again, asking the group, what are, what are examples of these, such as eating and drinking versus exercising and reading? Then there's ineffective and effective coping strategies. Ineffective is the inability to form a valid appraisal of the stressors, inadequate choices of practice responses, and or the inability to use available resources. And then there's effective coping strategies, which is what we want to use, which is when we invest our conscious effort to solve personal and interpersonal problems in order to master, minimize, or tolerate stress and conflict. Um, this is when we're able to adjust to stressful or traumatic situations through productive coping mechanisms and maybe less likely to experience anxiety, depression, and other mental health concerns as a result of stressful events. So occupational balance, which is what we're trying to achieve with our, with our caregivers. This refers to having a balance between selected and required activities and stressful and restful activities. So due to the number of hours most individuals, most caregiving tasks require, individuals taking on the caregiver role have been found to have an increased likelihood of experiencing occupational imbalance. So caregivers of those with brain injuries normally spend a large portion of their days and weeks attending to caregiver tasks. These tasks are normally strenuous and required rather than restful and chosen and occupy the majority of a caregiver's day. And having an imbalance in occupations can lead to higher rates of health problems in caregivers and decrease the quality of care for the person who's receiving the care. So these are the eight areas of occupation that we are trying to find a balance between. I'm not going to go over all of them in depth, but there's a lot that we do during the day and we really try to find a balance between our activities of daily living, our instrumental ADLs, our rest and sleep, education, work, play, leisure, and our social participation. So what this is and what was given at the end of the third day of the program was an occupational configuration that was blank. So what this is, I asked each person in the group to track the eight areas of occupation over three regular days. So if you're off on the weekends, don't just track weekend days, track a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and try to be as honest as possible. We want to find those imbalances in the day. So being honest with it will really help us find where those imbalances are, where we can implement those coping strategies. And then I just gave an example, occupational configuration, which was my own. Um, it was very easy, you know, when it was color coded to determine where the imbalances were, such as in the leisure and social participation areas. And um, it really helped the, the participants see what their configuration could look like and that it's okay to find those imbalances. So objectives of day four, we wanna identify areas in the configuration where there are imbalances in their schedules and discuss and learn coping strategies and stress outlets that they can incorporate into their daily routine in order to reduce stress and create balance. So some probing questions we wanna ask, where did we find imbalances? Were they in the morning? Were they at night? Was it all day long? Was just one big imbalanced day? 
um, any gaps that we can noticeably fit in coping strategies and outlets. And then asking the group if everyone can name some healthy coping techniques that could help them and choosing three and identifying where they could fit them into their daily routine. In the groups that I ran, some things that they noticed were that the caregiver spent a lot of time driving or they spent a lot of time cooking and things of that nature, um, things that they could do while, while listening or talking to somebody. So what people found was that while they were driving, they could call somebody on the phone in order to vent or just reduce any stress from the day on their way to work on the way home. They could listen to audiobooks, calming noises, um, meditations. And people also realized that they could fit in coping techniques before bed, you know, a five minute uh, meditation, guided meditation, a five minute yoga, Tai Chi, things like that. And this is really important to use with the occupational configuration because everybody says to, yes, add stress relieving activities into your day. But then we all ask where, where can I fit them? There's so much going on in the day, what can we do? So it was really helpful for the groups that I worked with for them to realize that even five minutes in their day can really um, have a positive impact on their coping strategies. And then day five, we wanted to discuss the success and failures of implementation of coping strategies in the daily routine, provide some resources, such as apps and local support groups to ensure carryover. We don't wanna leave the group hanging and reaffirm learning objectives used throughout the program. So implementation of coping strategies, some probing questions you could use. How did it go? What worked and what didn't? Was it time consuming to add something new into your day and did it help alleviate any stress? These are just some apps that I found with caregiving that you can you can supply, they have to do um, with caring for a person with a brain injury, it tracks medication management, um, tips for safety in the home, tracks medical appointments. And then there's helpful apps for stress reduction as well that are free apps that they can download and use following the program also. And then this was the initial survey that was used. Again, you can tailor it to your needs if you wanted to create a formal stress reduction program. Um, just a Likert scale that was used in the pre-survey and then what you hope to learn so that you can tailor the program to the specific individuals that will be in the program. And then the post-survey started with the same three questions in order to uh, determine any progress that was made throughout the program. And then what they felt was the most important strategy that they learned, what was the most helpful so that you can keep that in the program for the next time that you carry it out. So overall, program protocols centering around implementing effective behavior strategies and coping techniques into the caregiver routine are supported. It maintains the quality of life and the health for both the caregiver and the person receiving the care. And it supports that the skills provided by an OT in finding occupational balance and providing techniques for caring for those with brain injuries are crucial in the mental and physical well-being of the caregiver and the person receiving the care. And pertinent program for reducing stress levels and increasing competence levels in, when caring for someone with a brain injury. And the overall quality of life of both the caregivers and the person receiving the care should thus increase if following program protocols due to having healthier, more competent caregivers who are now equip, equipped with more effective strategies to use during their daily routine. If you enjoy your webinar series, I encourage you to connect with us on Facebook for more great educational content and client success stories. On behalf of Bancroft Neuro Rehab, I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar.